So the, you're going to get a basic uh, hypoxia 101 lesson here. And um, the Mississippi River, it, it, if you don't learn anything from this uh, week, the Mississippi River drives the physics, the biology, the coastal resources um, for the whole northern Gulf of Mexico and, and even further beyond that because some of the large migrating populations have moved in and out of the area. So it, the Mississippi drains about 41% of the continental U.S. and uh, it enters into the Gulf of Mexico through the what's called the Birdfoot Delta. The spill was about over here. And uh, about a third of the flow comes through the Atchafalaya. And most of these materials, this is a suspended sediment satellite image. So you're seeing the sediment from the flume and some colored dissolved organic matter. But uh, most, and what you're not seeing are the nutrients that are dissolved in the water, the nitrogen and the phosphorus, which come from fertilizers and other activities. But during the spring when the river's high, most of this material goes from the east to the west, and most of the uh, biological response here is to the west of the delta. In the summer, the current sort of switch around, and it starts to move close to shore, and then also towards the east, and sometimes we'll have hypoxia occurring east of the delta as well. Especially when the river flow is high and the currents are moving in that direction. So when the water comes into the Gulf, um, Mississippi River water um, is fresh and the Gulf of Mexico is salty. And um, fresh water is not as heavy as salt water, called density. So the fresh water, it'll mix, but it stays mostly towards the surface and the salt stays mostly towards the bottom. You get a layered system for much of the year. And it also brings in these dissolved nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, that are important which are very important because it fuels our highly productive food web in the Gulf of Mexico, while we have such rich fisheries for one reason. Uh, but there's been too many more nutrients put into the system over the last 40 to 50 years so that there's too much now. And not all the phytoplankton is goes up into the food web, and a lot of it sinks to the bottom, and some of it's incorporated into zooplankton, which fish as well, but in their fecal pellets. So, um, so there's a lot of carbon getting to the bottom, and bacteria can consume carbon, just like we do, and in the process we have oxygen. And there's so much carbon that they um, use up a lot of oxygen, and so they're depleting oxygen down here, and at the surface, what normally would happen is that the air would have oxygen that would diffuse into the water to diffuse to the bottom, or the phytoplankton themselves are like plants that produce oxygen. So, but because of this layering system, the oxygen doesn't get from the surface to the bottom, and the oxygen at the bottom just gets consumed at a very rapid rate. So that's how the oxygen gets low on the bottom. It's mostly a summer, spring, summer, early fall, Winds will mix it up in the winter, so that there's plenty of oxygen on the bottom, and we start all over again. We, it, it's already starting to develop out there right now, it was a couple of weeks ago. We have a huge amount of phytoplankton out there right now. The river is in high stage. Um, it's it's going to crest on the 14th, I think, at about 14 or 15, 16 feet. So a lot of fresh water right now, fueling the carbon that's eventually going to lead to the low oxygen. So, um, these are maps of what it looks like in the summer. We do three kinds of monitoring. We do a map in the summer, <coughs> and we have some transects uh, in this area, in this area that we do about once a month. And then we have um, observing systems uh, with um, monitors in two places along the coast. But this is a summer map, usually from the Delta well over onto Texas, um, up to 22,000 square kilometers in the size of the state of New Jersey, Rhode Island, Connecticut combined, or Massachusetts. And this is what it looked like in 2010. Uh, the well was capped in June, but there was still oil in this area right here. You can see it. 
Um, and we also had a tropical storm, so this was all mixed up when we headed out, so I started working in this direction, which is very unusual. I had to cut it short because I was afraid I was running out of time. Then I went back this way, and it had redeveloped. So the, this map is very different from most of the maps, uh, which complicates um, things, uh, making sense of things. So here's our, here's our tropical storm coming in. And uh, so we headed this way, we worked that way, we came back. And then we went to the Delta. So it was very different. But it was still an extremely large area, even with that big gap in the middle. And these are the sizes ever since we started doing this in 1985. And some of the lower years are due to drought conditions, less water, less nutrients. Some are smaller because we went out after the hurricane that got mixed up and it had to slow back down. And then these two years were because of the oceanographic currents were pushing it in one direction but also piling it up. So there was a huge volume of it as well. Okay. And the, the single most, um, the, the one factor that explains most of the variability in size is the amount of nitrate that comes down in a plus a year chunk. So it's closely related to the nitrogen and nitrate load coming from the river. And um, I think I've got this. Yeah, most of it comes from the middle of America along with the phosphorus and most of it um, is in, uh, is there because of agricultural activity. And these are the things that have changed over time. The river's been dredged, levied, channelized. Lots of things have happened to the river, but that all was in place well before these fertilizers were started to go up. So that's what's driving the hypoxia. The landscape and the watershed is no longer as functional as it used to be to deal with excess nutrients, but the aggravation is still a human, uh, human caused aggravation. Uh, we've lost our forests, uh, we've drained a lot of our wetlands, and in the main, in the main part, um, the crop rows have uh, plastic PVC pipes or tile pipes under them called tile drains. So the water just goes through the soil with the dissolved nutrients um, we've lost a lot of wetlands in the watershed as well, and wetlands are important because they can take up and transform nutrients. And we've also, again, as I said, straightened the river because of things like this, flooding and for navigation purposes. And most of the, what used to be a natural floodplain is no longer available to the river to spread out over uh, during flood periods when those wetlands and bottomland hardly forest could be removing nutrients. So, so as a result, more nutrients, more carbon, more flux, more uh, oxygen consumed, and more hypoxia. So um, everybody wanted to know this year if the oil spill caused the hypoxia. Well, no, it's because it started to form before the oil you know, came and it was well in place before any of the oil got to the west of the <coughs> um, But what people were concerned. And there's also a, a natural area of low oxygen in deeper water, which I'll show you in a minute. And um, so there are lots of things that could have been linked together. And to be quite honest, the media really wanted the oil spill to have caused the dead zone this year. And I had to fight that one. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, it also disrupted our science. Our two uh, stations where we have meters are here and here, and uh, we, we were close to a potential contamination, and um, when we got into the water at Promenade Pass, we saw this coming in to shore, and we were going to pick up some oils for various people. <laughs> Probably you yeah, saw it. We got some. some of that. Um, and um, but we went nine miles offshore, <coughs> only phytoplankton, just greenish water, greenish brown water, only phytoplankton. Two of my daughters were getting with me because they didn't know we were in the water. So, oh, it's just phytoplankton. So we got in, changed our meters. Half an hour later, we came up under this. And rafts of uh, oil, multiplied oil, and it, it was really nasty. We came up under it. We had full wetsuits, but um, I did get a blob in my hair, and they took me immediately to a bird cleaning station. <laughs> <laughs> not really, not really. But I did.
plenty of these gone yeah. at that time. <laughs> um, so it, it really disrupted um, our research because then we had to take hazardous diving classes and get the right suits and everything. So we lost a lot of our options in, in this last year because of this. Okay, this is the natural low oxygen. Uh, this is going from the surface down to 2,000 meters, and there's a natural low oxygen area in the Gulf at 300 to 800 meters. The spill is um, about right here. And those deeper water oxygen conditions are well offshore. Uh, it's at, and this is in the area of where the, the uh, deep water horizon platform grew up. And this is where the continental shelf so it's not really connected in the time or space. And, but they did find areas out there. Can we ask you a question, Sarah? Yes. We have to ask you later. Oh, go ahead, right now. Uh, I, I assume when you talk about uh, the media and the and the hypoxia, I think the story that we've been reporting on most has been the dead dolphins. Uh, is that, I mean, uh, I don't know if that's what you're talking about. No. Okay, uh, we've got a lot of dead dolphins and sea turtles, so that is not what you're talking about, is trying to link that to the hypoxia. Okay. Because I'm looking That's at where toxins. that is. That's toxins, not. And green mammals get their air from the surface, so they, they're not uh, restricted by hanging air. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, then, then I remember doing um, research on um, HAVs, and that was part of the like, respiratory distress that your lungs were getting. Did right. there there's a correlation between HAVs, which are harmful allergens, and some toxin producing phytoplankton. And I'm going to talk about that just, just a little bit. Okay. And yeah, plus, yeah. So that would answer her question probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so um, this is um, in the area of the uh, deep water horizon. Subsurface plumes were at about 1,200 meters, and they did find some low oxygen conditions where there was a peak in fluorescence, which would indicate the presence of oil. But this is in no way even near the natural low oxygen levels, and in no way close to being what would be called hypoxia. And there were several of these, what are they called, oxygen anomalies found. Uh, unfortunately, these are different units. Uh, but um, there were lots of them found, but they were just, you know, barely different in the long-term average, and certainly not to the level that could be called hypoxia. In other instances, one of the first papers that was published by Camille et al. in Science um, did some uh, chemical tests uh, to compare these low oxygen values and did not find low oxygen. So some people found it, some people didn't, and in all cases it was not life threatening. And so we went out, uh, this is the period of the spill, our shelf life cruise is right here, and you can see for 2010 we had a lot of, a lot of fresh water, and during our cruise um, and before there was above average uh, fresh water and nutrients getting into the Gulf of Mexico. So lots of lots of blooms and lots of hypoxia and I already showed you this. But I wanted to point out this area right here where we did, we had been seeing some oil sheens in this area during the spring, uh, definitely saw oil here, and then during the cruise we saw some over here. And um, this is the fluorescence from the ship going surface to, this is only about uh, 40 meters of water. And it's really high right here. And someday, Scott and Ed are going to be able to you know, get them some money to analyze those samples for us. Um, but they, this is the oxygen that was in the water column at that station. There's lots of oxygen at the surface. So the carbon in the hydrocarbons was not forming the base uh, for bacterial decomposition to the, back to the tune that it would really be the oxygen. Because there were tons of phytoplankton producing. And um, we usually have hypoxia at this station, but not this summer. So you can see that none of it was hypoxia. So there's, there's really no evidence that the oil contributed to any oxygen loss uh, in the area of the continental shelf or the low oxygen cruise. Now, one thing that did happen is that the state of Louisiana diverted some fresh water to keep the oil out of the area, along with building burns. Um, and 
and what happened, you know, there's oil, there's oil. Well, no, it's not. It's like an hour ago. It's died from it. It probably had some toxic, it did have some toxic species in it. And uh, a lot of fish will go to these blooms and they'll get in the confined spaces and they'll basically suffocate each other because there's no oxygen. Or there may have been some toxins in the water as well. And so you can't separate everything out. And there was probably oil in there. It's difficult to separate these things out, um, which is why you all need to figure out how to separate things out from the source of the source. So I think we probably, um, too specific to this lecture questions because we've got two more speakers and I'm supposed to be keeping everybody on time. <laughs> you know, we have a lot more time for questions. long-term data set that we will be using to look at differences, but the, the problem is you don't know the exposure or the level of exposure, and you can have a lot of variability from year to year in phytoplankton populations just based on the different types of nutrients that are coming in. Some you're going to learn over and over again is that uh, it's difficult to separate oil impacts from just natural variability. Um, there's all seeps all over. Just so happens we have a lot of them here in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, just uh, as far as little features, uh, six, 600,000 square miles for the Gulf of Mexico, um, extending from Cape Sable to the Yucatan uh, Peninsula. Um, the coastline uh, all together is 30, pr approximately 3,500 um, miles as far as coastline. That's a lot of coastline. It's a very diverse coastline. Um, if you've ever been to the Gulf Coast, you, you can pretty much mangrove swamps. Uh, marshes, um, beaches, pretty much anything and everything you'll see on the, the Gulf Coast. Um, our portion for the U.S. portion is 1,600, uh, approximately 1,600 uh, miles. Um, if you look at all the bays, if just looking down here, as, you, as you're driving down the coast, uh, getting here to Cocodre, you can see all the inlets and uh, uh, various uh, surface areas that we have in, in the bays. Uh, that extends out to 16,000 miles if you look at it. So that's 16,000 miles that can be potentially polluted by oil. 38% uh, of the Gulf waters are shallow intertidal areas, um, very productive areas. They are uh, uh, breeding grounds for uh, very, very species of fish, um, just a very diverse area where we have uh, forest tourism and also uh, fisheries, which I think we'll go over that later. And I don't know if it's tomorrow or Friday. Um, today. Okay, you're going to go for today. Okay, I wasn't sure when that was going to happen. Uh, just some other facts. Uh, 643 quadrillion gallons. Off the top of my head, uh, last night I just calculated with the, the, the um, oil spill from the Deepwater Horizon. If we took all the oil, which was roughly, I want to say, 215 million gallons of oil and, and dumped it in, which was dumped into that, that amount, that would give you around 200 250 part per million overall. That's if it was mixed together. Um, that gives you a rough idea of just there, there's a lot of water out there for, for the oil to be in just to find it. And that's been one of the problems with this spill that just occurred last year. Um, the loop current, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the loop current. That was one of the big, initially one of the big problems we were looking at when, the, when we had the deep water horizon spill. The way it comes, it comes uh, past the Yucatan Peninsula, sweeps through the, the middle of the Gulf, and goes around the, the tip of Florida, and pushes the, the water close to, uh, to to the Atlantic. Um, what one of the big concerns when we had this spill was, will the oil, the, the dispersed oil from the from the deep well injection, will it um, get caught into this loop current and hit the, the Atlantic coast? Um, after about two or three weeks, I think every piece of boom in the United States had been bought up, and a lot of it was going to the Atlantic uh, seaboard, where a lot of the a lot of the coastal cities were buying it and putting it in their uh, bays, just trying to keep the oil that what they presumed was going to be oil coming through. Um, portions of the loop current often break away, forming uh, eddies and our gyres, which uh, affect the local current, and that's some of the current that we deal with with that oil being pushed on the, um, into the state of Louisiana. 
just give you a rough idea after this. Starts here, goes through, all the way to here. And also, we, this counts part of Cuba also. Um, a lot of what we deal with uh, for is the, the oil in, in the Gulf of Mexico is the out, uh, Outer Continental Ship, OCS. Um, it used to be Minerals Management Service. Uh, somebody's going to have to correct me because recently, within the last six months, it's changed over the Bureau of Energy, and it's a yeah, so it, it, it's it's changed, and uh, we have a project with them, and they're they're making us change all the wording in it now. So, um, but anyway, uh, approximately 86 billion barrels of oil and more than 420 trillion cubic feet of natural gas are pulled from the, annually from the, the Gulf of Mexico. Well, that's how much I'm sorry. That's how much it, it's estimated that it's holding. Um, if you look, the uh, resources of the lower 48 states alone are enough to provide gasoline for, for the 134 million cars and heating oil for 6.3 million homes. It's just a lot of, uh, of uh, fuel, uh, either gas or oil, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and yet you have to realize that some of it, it's not going to stay there always. So this is just some boring facts. I'll just go over this real quick. I just wanted to make a point that consume total U.S. liquid fuels consume 18.8 million gallons per day. That's a lot of fuel, uh, oil, gas being pulled out that needs to be pulled out of the, um, the mainly the Gulf of Mexico and, and Alaska, the, the major ones that are, are producing oil for the U.S. and those that are being imported. Uh, Gulf of Mexico offshore share of the U.S. crude oil production is 29% which is a very large number uh, compared to some of the other states. Some of the refineries, I put this up because later I'm going to go over some slides with the, um, we call it the, the Hurricane Katrina incident. Uh, a lot of the oil contributing to the, the spills in the Gulf of Mexico were um, produced by some of these refineries. And you can see there's a lot, the Gulf Coast has a lot of refineries. This is Louisiana alone. Um, Texas, as you can see, all of the 48% of the, right here, 48% of the production in the U.S. is produced along the Gulf Coast, mainly Louisiana, Texas, but you do have some in a, a few other states. This is a, I think a slide, uh, a picture from the um, NOAA website. By the way, if you're ever interested in just oil spills, anything to do with that, oil spill remediation, NOAA has an excellent website. Um, it's NOAA O R N R. Gov, but if you just search it, you should. There's various websites, but they, if any type of spill, historically, you look at any spills or any current spills, they they have uh, incident news that they put up, and you can get a lot of information from that. They're very good in the la about the last five to ten years. Um, Noah's taken on a lot more of a role in for producing media, uh, media coverage, uh, and public relations information. So. They've been producing a lot of good um, products as far as uh, looking at spill incidents. Um, this is just a slide showing all the active oil and gas platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. As you can see, there's a good many of them. There's over 4,000 of them. Uh, these are, I think this, these numbers are from 2007 or 2008. Uh, this is a more recent one. This gives you a little bit of history about it. As far as the, tells you the, of course, the depth, which you can see on the outer continental shelves, that's where we're getting a lot of the deep water um, uh, platforms. This is the, uh, you know, I'd say uh, deep water horizon. This is the um, Mississippi Canyon block right here, which deep water horizon is probably, I think it's roughly 45 um, miles southeast of uh, the path. So, I'm sorry, man. Uh, these are all federal, right? This is offshore. Yeah, these are all federal. So there's a lot more drilling. Really there's a, there's tons more. Going on. Yeah, and and I was going to say it later, but there's tons of spills that occur every day. I mean, far as uh, Mosquito Bay, a lot of these more I, I want to call them inland, but they're going to be confined more or less to to the bays within uh, and the estuaries within Louisiana. So a lot of it doesn't really get out. It unfortunately it stays within these areas. Um, we have Mosquito Bay, um, 
2010, is it 2009, we had the Westchester, which uh, is pretty well publicized. It was the one in New Orleans and Mississippi River, the downtown near the river walk. Uh, I think a, a barge um, was struck, and it, it, I want to say number six fuel oil was leaking. So it was a good bit of oil. It, it was very publicized just because the fact it was in New Orleans, you could walk out on the levee and look at it, and it was a lot going on with that. Um, Texas City, Texas, we had, a, it was an oil slash a sulfuric acid um, incident. When was it? I think it was 2009, summer of 2009, because I spent probably about four weeks there. I was supposed to, uh, I packed, oh, they called me in the middle of the morning, packed an overnight bag, with, drove down there, found out I hadn't spent there, I, I was going to be there three to four weeks. Uh, what had happened, a, a barge um, had ruptured, a double line barge had ruptured with sulfuric acid. Once you start mixing the water with the sulfuric acid, it, exothermic reaction gets real, real hot. It pretty much started to bulge. And what it was, it was right, it had docked right in the middle of the refinery and they couldn't move it. Um, and it just so happened, I don't know if you're familiar with the explosions, but back in 1949, the, the uh, the fertilizer, bar, the fertilizer ship it exploded. I can't remember the name of it, but it just wiped out the entire Texas City, Texas area within, I think, 20 square miles. Um, it, it caught on fire, and the, the ammonium nitrate exploded. It just a, a huge explosion. It was an accidental explosion. Well, this was the same dock that it occurred at. So by the time I got there, there was helicopters flying over. Um, didn't know what was going on. Had to ask the, uh, the Coast Guard commander what was going on. Turned out it was the anniversary of the, of the explosion, and so they were predicting that it was going to have another explosion on the anniversary. So that was the big deal with that. But there's tons of this isn't within the state. Well, these are all federal uh, waters. So there's tons of stuff that goes on within the state that I don't want to say you don't know about, but they're so minute. They may release 50, 100 gallons. Which they're all reportable. Anytime you, anytime there's a sheen released, they're responsible for reporting to the Coast Guard, and there, there's going to be a real hefty fine associated with that. So if the, the sheen, if you see a sheen, you have to report it. So there's lots of stuff going on. We just don't see it. Just doesn't make the news. So we said over over 4,000 active oil and gas platforms, um, 79 to 85 deep water units. And that's some of the major concerns. Five years ago, we had we had um, worked with MMS, and they had were, were looking into maybe um, doing some research similar to the Deepwater Horizon spill, but we just didn't have the technology or the, the facilities available to, to research uh, um, how the oil reacts. The only real large pressure tank we have that we can do something like that because it's at fairly uh, high pressure, 100 150 psi. Are, is located in Hawaii. So, yes. Is there anyone ever models something that's like with uh, nitrogen hydrate? There is, yeah. The no, uh, MMS is uh, currently they're looking into that. So, I mean, prior to the spill, had anyone ever studied like the formation of methane hydrates with those kind of pressures and temperatures? Yeah, they're 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 re yeah that's been researched a good bit. I mean, they're looking into of course energy source. I mean, there's a good bit of research in that. Um, I don't have the uh, map of that, but there are areas that are mapped, and the Gulf of Mexico has a good bit of uh, areas that do have that the hydrate. So. Uh, natural oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, if you look at it, approximately 560 to 1.4 million, uh, 560,000, 1.4 million barrels per year. Um, which is, that's a good number, uh, 1,500 to 3,800 barrels per day seep into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I think I have a slide with uh, various locations of the seeps. Um, just in comparison to Deepwater Horizon, uh, estimated from 35,000 to 6,000 barrels a day in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's a that's if you were to estimate, because they really haven't come up with a, a good number. Um, it depends on who you're talking with. You, it, it's going to range between that. So it's hard to give you a good estimate of what, what the numbers actually are. So the Deepwater Horizon is actually emitting 13 to 20 times more than all the natural seeps across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this satellite image imagery uh, from NASA showing some uh, what actually the, the oil seeps look like. 
Um, about three years ago, we did a project with MMS uh, looking at, we, we went out on, I think, three cruises looking for um, uh, natural oil seeds bubbling up. You can actually see them coming up and sheening on top of the water. Now, it's like finding a needle in a haystack, so what we had to end up doing is trying to get some uh, most recent photos and try to extrapolate where they may be next. So we did find a few, but it's very hard to, to find those seeps. What we were looking at was looking at the uh, volatile hydrocarbons that were coming from these seeps. How were they affecting the ozone? And they were looking at the ozone problems in Baton Rouge and Houston, which Houston and Houston has a, a fairly large ozone problem at the moment. Uh, during the summer, when it starts getting hot, uh, they're they don't know what to contribute to. They're, they're saying mostly it's automobile uh, um, exhaust um, gases that are causing the ozone, uh, uh, the, the breaking up the ozone layer, um, and causing the ozone uh, formation in those in those cities. But they're trying to, uh, I guess, baseline out what the Gulf of Mexico is uh, producing. So. We're just trying to look at it and see if, is the Gulf of Mexico or the National Oil Seeps producing that much ozone where they're affecting cities like Houston and, um, and Baton Rouge. Can I ask the sun point, is that the sheet reflecting off that's the reflecting, No, that's okay. reflecting off the water. That's how it should yeah. look naturally okay, at, so at that angle. Now, it's as certain with the word of the sun at that angle. But as you can see here, the, the streaking formation that's going to be your um, oil chain. Here's a close-up of it. You can see it a lot better, with more resolution here. But all these are our natural oil, oil chains. And I apologize, but this is a um, very hazy slide, but it's about the best one we can find. They really haven't updated them recently. Uh, Nancy, you may have some better ones than this one, but. Uh, as of present, they found actually 63 natural seeps in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, here's, this is the MC252 uh, block here, or the, the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, when I say MC252, that's the actual block. It's kind of funny, you hear a lot of different names for the spill. The Deepwater Horizon um, is the actual platform itself. The MC252 is the block, and I think I may have a picture of it later later and it's the 252 area. So it, it depends on who you're talking with. Uh, you're going to hear different, I'll say stories, but different names for the, uh, the spill itself. So they're pretty much talking about the same ones. But the problem is when we were recently, we, they were doing a lot of dives, uh, or not dives, but taking samples from the, the uh, bottom samples from near the, the rig itself where it had fallen, the, the well. Um, they were finding a lot of background oil. This area is going to be all, pretty much all the same oil. It's very, very, very hard to differentiate the oil from that MC252 oil spill from a seep that's in this area. And there are uh, several seeps that are within this area, um, but they're very small. Um, you, you have to know, uh, of course, the geology of it. The, these fields are all underneath the seabed. Um, they may be um, slightly different from each other, but they were formed at the same time. The oil was formed uh, from the same time um, in the same region, so you're, they're going to be very, very close in characteristics as far as uh, looking at them. Um, I'm not giving a, I don't think I am um, giving a presentation on the oil chemistry, but it can be very complex and just let, just for you to know that we have, we look at instruments that we have that are able to differentiate from oil if it was from here to here, if it was a different type of oil, we can differentiate that very easily. But if, if you're looking at oil in this area from seeps and from the, the well itself, it's going to be very, very hard to differentiate between that. And so that's one some of the science that we're looking at right now, trying to get a better handle on that. Yes? So that's going to come into play as you look at starting to try to differentiate like, uh, within the NRDA process. Once yeah, it will. Spill, and it's going to be one of the main seeps. points that we're looking at. There's a lot of labs looking at. Um, our lab is set up for response. Uh, during this spill, as you said, the, the NERDA, the uh, damage assessment side, we're 
pretty much on the response side. We look at it, tell you what what's wrong with it. I mean, we're not wrong with it, but what, what's the characteristic of this oil, what it's going to do, what type of oil. It wasn't that difficult. It was South Louisiana crude oil, uh, but what it's going to do, okay? Once the, the spill has been stopped, now we get into the damage assessment and looking at what was damaged, um, what areas were polluted, and that's where NERDA comes in, National Response and Damage Assessment. Uh, uh, they, they're going to look at it and tell you, give a, a definite money, monetary value of how much was damaged. So. There's been tons of it. The problem is we have lots of information, but we don't know if the information is correct for us estimating what what was the volume. I mean, there, there's not that big deal doing a mass balance, but the problem is do you have the correct volume? You may get one one person estimating on one side of the country, okay, looking, and the problem is, they were, you, you, as you know, everyone was looking at that same television screen. Oh, I was asking about the C. The seeps, oh, I'm sorry. Well, they have, they've um, taken a lot of submersibles out um, and they've, they've studied the seeps. Um, they've, they've videoed it and they it's a very, very rough estimate. I mean, they, and you know, they, they probably haven't found all the seeps. Seeps can occur anywhere. So anywhere there's a, a, a fracture in the, the seabed, you're gonna get a seep. So it's matter where the where least amount of resistance where the oil is going to come up. So that's how it's going to occur. And it's gas too, right? Yeah, you don't have a lot of it at the top end of the reservoir is going to be gas and that's what happened to the uh, uh, Deepwater Horizon. They had a lot, of, a lot of gas came out initially but then it's, it started flowing a little good bit of oil. Uh, Mississippi Canyon, this area here, the DeSoto Canyon, so each of the blocks are divided. This is Green Canyon. This this Green Canyon is where we did a lot of our studies for the oil seeps. You do have a lot of oil seeps in that area. So um, I'm, I'll go over quickly. Like I said, a lot of this information is on the NOAA website, so I'll go over briefly. Um, I'm going over probably the six or seven of the major spills that have been Gulf of Mexico. Like I said before, there's I can name probably about 30 or 40 that have occurred along the coast that are within the the boundaries within the waterways, but they never really made it to the Gulf of Mexico. So, and these are the major ones, the mo most publicized ones that we saw. And uh, it's going to go in chronological order. So back in 1979, we had the Ixtoc. That was one of the, the first big major spill in the Gulf of Mexico. As you can see, this is about the same color as some of the oil that was coming from the deep water horizon. And the reason why, this was, at even though it was at 200 feet, it was very shallow as well as are considered. It was it had a lot of gas in it and it was pressurized coming up, same as the deep water horizon. When it was coming up, it had a lot of gas in it. It was mixed with water. And once you mix the water and oil becomes a, a, a emulsification, that, that thick reddish or I say orange looking oil, and it changes the refractive index of the, the oil itself. That's just because of the fact that it has a lot of water. Uh, we're seeing now if you had that same oil and you let it sit there and it's, the, the summer is starting to warm up a little bit more each each day, you can see if you had that oil sitting there, it would start to uh, form the black oil again just because of the fact that it, it heats up and it removes some of the water. Uh, just just some of the information and release uh, 10 to 30,000 barrels. Um, uh, estimated uh, one, 113 million to over 300 million gallons of oil has spilled. Just like the deep water horizon, they just had they was a hard time estimating how much oil it was filled. Depends on what side. If you're on NERDA, you're doing 300,000 gallons. If you're on the response side, you want to say 113, which means you cleaned up a lot more when, at, by the end. So it depends on who whose um, viewpoint you're looking at. That's that's why we have two sets of numbers that were that they give a very broad range. Um, let's wrap it up. Okay. They used a lot of dispersants. Yeah, that was used a lot in the first. Did that have anything to do with the color? No. no. That was after. It was um, Sheen's after when it was headed toward Mexico. And was it the same dispersion? Correct? Uh, yeah, correct. Um, uh, I think 90, um, 9527. So not sub C, just for the Yeah. They had really, this is the first time we ever used sub C. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Which may take longer answer, but the 
you're talking about the natural seeps, what are the different ecological impacts though of like, okay, so there, there's always the oil there, is there a problem with like oil companies saying, oh, there's always been oil in the water versus like when an oil spill happens? Well, that way we can, differ, we can differentiate between uh, natural seeps a lot of times and oil that's spilled from a, like a ship or something. Mm -hmm. When it coming from the sea floor like it did with the, the deep water horizon, it's the same type of oil that's naturally seeping out. Um, those areas are act. Listen. It's just that you have volume then, like it's just. Yeah, it, it's it's not as much, but it, it does. Con it's a constant flow coming out. Okay, this is. Uh, I think uh, sunshine. You're gonna have this where everyone can look at it. Yes. Uh, I'm just gonna go quickly over it. You can look at the statistics later. Um, uh, uh, Alvinus uh, was in 18. I mean, sorry, 19. 1984, as you can see, this gentleman right here, I think he's barefooted, I have one slide that having he's barefooted. Not the smartest thing to do during an oil spill. <coughs> uh, the Megaborg, which is a very large spill that occurred near Galveston. Uh, it's a very well publicized spill, there's lots of information on that. Um, Bouchard D-155, this is a, in Tampa, near Tampa Bay. We still see oil from this. Um, we will get oil uh, from the mangrove swamps, and it's buried in the sand off Tampa Bay. Um, for every about every five years, if there's a, a large enough storm come through, um, we'll the SSC scientific support coordinator from NOAA will send it to us, and we'll analyze it, and it, it's the same stuff we have archived from um, back then. Um, Hurricane <coughs> Katrina. These are all the facilities that spilled oil. We had over 8 million gallons of oil released. That's from some of the major releasers. That it was just a good bit of oil, but the problem was, or a good thing was, it was spread out. The problem was we had to get to it. So it was very, very hard getting to, to clean this up. Just cleaning it up wasn't the problem, it was just getting to it. As you can see, some of these areas are pretty well devastated. This area was just 14 feet of oil. I mean, with the water came through, a wave came through. That it was around 14, 15 feet up in the air. The oil was staying in the deep water horizon. Estimated, I think it was like 500 and uh, close to 510 um, million gallons released. Yes. Yeah. I, okay, this is my last one. She's about, to, she's about to nudge me. This is just a comparison, a year of comparison of uh, the oil um, release. Deepwater Horizon, if you release all of it, each one of these spills, with the, that's their, their amounts in gallons, millions of gallons. If you look at it, Deepwater Horizon released a lot of oil compared to other ones. This is natural seeps over one year. Over the 31 year period that these spills occurred that I just looked at, the natural seeps are just a huge amount compared over time compared to all these spill, combined spills together. So you have to take it into, um, over time, we are releasing a lot of oil, but people really just don't realize it. It's, it's uh, over 233 um, billion gallons are being released. Uh, I think that, yeah. So th there's a lot of oil being released in the Gulf of Mexico. That's that's the point on this. So I think I've overrun my time. I'm happy to run. So. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, I'm a fisherman. I get to fish both recreationally and professionally. Um, and inshore, we have speckled trout fishing, red and black drum, flounder, sheep's head. Uh, and yes, we really do catch speckled trout two at a time. That's how good the fishing is here. <coughs> Uh, offshore, we've got green water, we've got snapper, all types of snapper, king and Spanish mackerel, cobia, pompano, pompano, and other, many other species. Um, and these are all, again, uh, pictures from actual fishing trips that I was on or some friend of mine. Uh, blue water, uh, and again, this is Brutus Green Canyon was mentioned earlier. All these fish were caught around this rig. It acts like a pad, which is a fish aggregating device uh, sitting out there in the middle of the ocean. Louisiana is the second leading U.S. fishing uh, fisheries landing state, second only to Alaska, mostly saltwater. We're also the second leading U.S. aquaculture production state, mostly freshwater, catfish and crawfish. Um, commercial landings were the leader among the lower 48 states, coming for greater than 80% of the uh, Gulf landings uh, most of the time. And uh, recreationally, we lead uh, Catches. So we catch more fish when we go fishing, and this is an actual fishing trip that took place. That's a one-day catch out of Cocoa Marina. So what generates this tremendous productivity? Nancy mentioned it earlier. The drainage in the Mississippi River generates this huge production. Uh, so it's one of the most valuable and productive ecosystems, certainly in the U.S., but you could say on the planet. It's also one of the most heavily impacted. We've heard a little bit about impacts so far. Uh, I put a paper on, on, uh, that has this diagram in it. Um, we've met, uh, modified our wetlands. We've had land loss, hydrologic changes, saltwater intrusions, water diversions. Uh, all of these things can affect stock abundance, fisheries habitat, and community structure of the fishes. Uh, we've also done things like put artificial reefs in the name form of rigs and structures. That has an impact, uh, in some cases positive, in other cases not. Uh, we've got pollution problems, obviously eutrophication, contaminants. We've heard a lot about oil. Uh, introduced species, you haven't heard anything about that. And what I'm going to hammer home is that fishing has a huge impact because we're removing a lot of biomass. Uh, we have directed fisheries. We have a lot of bycatch because we have a shrimp trawl fishery, which is, which is very important here. Uh, and then, uh, so we, we draw and draw, trawl and then we dredge for oysters and things like that. So the big three, the, uh, and from my perspective, the hammer killing fish uh, is fishing effects. But we know that coastal change and habitat loss is important because we're changing the habitat. and. Uh, Nancy talked a little bit about eutrophication <coughs> and hypoxia, and this has an influence on, on fish and their behaviors uh, and potentially their production. So, uh, still, when you look at uh, the yields from this system, they surpass the other state fishery yields uh, by an order of magnitude easily. And over the last decade or so, typ typically, um, since they've been keeping statistics, Louisiana yields about 6 million metric tons uh, of landings uh, in a decade. Um, that's a lot of fish. So the question I asked and I talked about, I'm, I'm going to save the questions to last. That's so just commercial. But uh, I'm going to ask you to save questions till the end and then we can all ask. Um, so we'll stay on schedule. Um, the paper I gave you was a little bit about are there any obvious trends in the production uh, yields of the fishes uh, that are reflected in these environmental impacts. Uh, that, that's the question. Uh, and if you look at uh, commercial landings, these are total commercial landings, and you can see a decline here. Uh, but if you remove menhaden, which is our most abundant species, uh, and we don't, we don't eat it, we render it into fish meal and oil, uh, you can see that it's been an increase and then pretty steady over a very long period of time. This is a period of 25 years. So um, total landings have been uh, fairly stable and consistent. Uh, 
Again, I mentioned Menhaden. This is Menhaden. We actually had very high peak productions here, but the declines are not because of the decline in the population. Uh, the, the stock assessments show that this has been a stable uh, quality fishery. Uh, it's Again, it's a rendering fishery. You have a, a problem with Atlantic Menhaden right now. It's very different for the Gulf Menhaden. They're doing quite well. It's a highly sustainable fishery that is, uh, is being uh, harvested at a relatively low rate in a very sustainable rate. So these declines you see here uh, are not population uh, reflection. They actually used to have more what we call poach plants, Menhaden uh, plants in the Gulf Coast. Uh, they actually had one at one time uh, right here in the uh, Dulac Chauvin area, uh, but those are no longer here. So the fishery shrunk a little bit. Uh, so there are, are fewer uh, businesses within that fishery now. The fishery is healthy. If you look at things like uh, shrimp landings across the Gulf, they've been stable over a relatively long period of time. This is 30 years or so. Um, if we look at the percent of fertile crescent landings to Louisiana for white and brown shrimp, the two major shrimp species in the Gulf of Mexico, you can see that the trend uh, has been fairly stable. Now we had, well, this is 2009, obviously there might have been some harvest issues with regard to the closures, but surprisingly, uh, a lot of white shrimp uh, were landed in 2009. I, I was surprised by myself when I looked at that, but this is, again, uh, brown shrimp is the most abundant species out there. They land more brown shrimp than white shrimp in the Gulf of Mexico, but Within Louisiana, white shrimp is far more important. About 65% of the landings of white shrimp are, come from Louisiana, and that's because they're, they grow better in fresh water, you know, with the fresh water influence than do brown shrimp. Uh, if you look at trends in fertile crescent landings for these two, this is fertile crescent. And when I say fertile crescent, I'm talking about basically the landings for the three states that are highly influenced by the Mississippi River. So Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas is the, the so-called Fertile Crescent. Uh, and uh, again, they've been stable, uh, actually increasing trend for uh, white shrimp and a slightly decreasing trend for brown shrimp. And that's a little bit of a surprise because the last time I plotted this out to 2000, uh, they were both fairly stable. So I don't know what's going on there, but I haven't had time to plot that. Um, this is fishery independent data for those two shrimp species, which means collected by a science process to, to try to you know, corroborate the landings data. And again, over this 20 year period, you can see it's been uh, very stable. <coughs> Up and down, that's recruitment variability, uh, but stable. Uh, blue crabs, another very important commercial species. Most of the brute blue crab landings uh, within the Gulf of Mexico are landed to Louisiana. You can see uh, Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi within the Fertile Crescent, but the productivity of the river generates this, this tremendous disparity between Louisiana and these other two states in the yields of this species. And so if you're eating blue crabs up in Maryland or someplace, there's a fair chance that they're coming from here. Uh, okay, so I would suggest that in terms of fisheries yields, uh, with all these things that we've done to this environment, all these uh, things going on, um, that there are really no signs of impacts to the fisheries yield. Um, so what about community structure? We know that trawling, again, uh, has been going on for a long time, and these are some old uh, fishery, uh, again, fishery-dependent data between uh, the 1936 time frame in the early 1990s where they looked at trawl bycatch and the composition of that trawl bycatch uh, in the fishery. Uh, and what you see here is kind of interesting. Um, there's been a dramatic shift in numbers of certain species like Atlantic croaker used to be much more abundant and, and they're far less abundant. Sand sea trout, there's a all the, basically to summarize it, all the demersal species, the ones that live on the bottom that are subject to trawl uh, as especially as juveniles, uh, appear to have been affected over that time period in terms of their relative abundance compared to what they used to be. Uh, and the two um, pelagic species that show up in falls in high abundance, bay anchovy and gulf menhaden, 
they are now relatively more abundant. And there was probably some complex things going on here, but I'm not going to go into it right now. OK, a little question for you. Uh, true or false, fishing is the principal cause of fish mortality in wild populations. True or false? True. OK. Um, the answer is false. <laughs> Predation <laughs> is the number one thing that kills every single organism that's out there. Fish eat other fish, and we eat fish. We kill a lot of fish, but they kill each other all the time, eating each other. And uh, they die at tremendously high numbers. As a fish biologist, I think about births and deaths a lot, and we're going to get into that a little bit, and some of the consequences of that. So that was a trick question. <laughs> Chronic versus episodic events. We've had a, uh, a lot of episodic events, and they're very common in coastal systems. Now, under most, I'm going to tell you the answer to this time. Under most circumstances, chronic mortality events are much more impactful to ecosystems, function, and integrity than episodic events. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get into that. But episodic events are usually more visually stunning and as I point out here, hence attracted to the media. And, I, and, I, and I've just got a few examples and some pictures. Um, 1989 freeze. That was when I first got here. I didn't know a lot about this system. Uh, we showed up one morning, Christmas morning, 1989, or sorry, New Christmas Eve morning. And a couple days later, this is what we had. Millions of fish died. Very, very, and I, I thought, oh my God. <laughs> What's going to be the impact of this? It's going to be horrible. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, again, uh, fish die from things other than fishing mortality and natural mortality. Um, Nancy mentioned kills from toxic algae are very common. Um, now, those are episodic events. Fishing is a chronic event. It goes on every year. This is the Louisiana bycatch. It makes up about 16% of the landings uh, that occurs uh, every year in the Gulf of Mexico to Louisiana. These are the landings from the other states, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, and so on. You can see our bycatch, just what they're killing with trawls and throwing back overboard, is far greater than the landings from other any other state, uh, <coughs> say Mississippi, which is close, but not, not even close to it. So this is 16% of that. It's a lot, a lot of fish. Um, but now let's compare. I didn't even put Louisiana landings on this graph because it, it doesn't scale well. Uh, so this is our bycatch. Again, Texas and uh, Mississippi landings. The 1989 freeze killed millions of fish, metric tons. We're talking, you know, five or six thousand metric tons. That's ten to the third. Uh, there was a Texas hab kill, killed several million fish, probably about ten. Uh, 10,000 metric tons of fish. That's a lot of fish. Hurricane Andrew killed over 20,000 metric tons of fish, but it doesn't compare to the chronic effects because they're episodic effects. And in a highly productive system, it can absorb those types of impacts and keep on cranking. Okay, little thing about productive productivity of systems. Um, Coastal zones adjacent to rivers are highly productive, and that's what we have here. So the Amazon, this system, they're incredibly productive. Upwelling zones are actually the most productive uh, systems uh, on, on the face of the planet uh, and, and in a relatively small area. Uh, and again, this is for you, you folks that don't know what upwelling is. Basically, uh, the winds uh, blow in a certain pattern. Uh, the highs within the ocean sit in a certain place. And it brings nutrient-rich water along with gases that promote uh, primary production at the surface. Uh, and so you get this tremendously productive system. Um, and this is uh, one of the most famous upwellings uh, in, in the world, the Peruvian Anchoveta and Sardine Catches. These are FAO statistics over about 50 years. Uh, and you can see it's a boom and bust type of production. Uh, and my point is, again, um, when El Nino occurs, and that's basically a shift in the oceanographic patterns that stop the upwelling or reduce the amount of upwelling, 
you have these systems start to collapse. So here's El Nino. And this is with fishing, okay? This is the catches. Uh, and what happens is when you're fishing during El Nino events, it exacerbates the crashes. So uh, the fishing is much more impactful under a low productivity declining event. And so uh, sometimes um, if the populations are low and going up, uh, it can have a different impact um, than it can when they're declining. But anyway, uh, again, these are, um, this is a boom and bust system. It's much more productive overall than our system out here, but it's also not as stable. And I think, uh, and I'm, I'm going to get to a point with regard to that uh, later on. Um, okay, um, births and deaths, that's what I think about. Um, Gulf Coast pelican populations were among the healthiest before the spill, but they weren't always healthy. We actually had to restart them in Louisiana. Uh, oops. Um, we had to restart them in Louisiana because we killed them off because of DDT. And they were restarted, uh, and they were uh, doing quite nicely. Uh, we lost a lot of birds, including pelicans. Uh, these weren't all pelicans, but again, a lot of death. This is an, an episodic event. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying this is in a horrible event, it could have been avoided. But the fact is, is that uh, with an episodic event, um, a man-made episodic event, there are actually natural events that go on. This is uh, an example for El Nino, an ENSO event, uh, where uh, off the uh, west coast of Peru and whatnot, they had an estimated 70,000 adult and 210,000 nestling, uh, nestling Peruvian pelicans start to death in Peru. So that's a natural event that's killing many, many, many more time, times more organisms than what, we're, what we saw with this oil spill, just to put it in perspective. Uh, so this is a uh, horrible ecological event, but I believe that because of the productivity of the system and its capacity and the resilience of it, it uh, will deal with it quite well. So what are some of the likely effects on fishes? Uh, this is a four-day-old fish. They start out as larvae. Uh, they have a swim bladder. Um, there are a lot of species spawning dur during deep water horizon, and undoubtedly, uh, we lost a lot of those young uh, eggs and fish larvae uh, because they can't move, and they're highly uh, vulnerable to oil toxicity. Uh, oil affects the ability to inflate, inflate the swim bladder, so even if there was no toxicity associated with it, but just enough sheen on the surface so that they can't penetrate, suck an air bubble up, and inflate their bladder, chances are they're going to die. So we lost a lot of young fish. Um, but young fish die at high rates in natural systems anyway. So the impact is going to be very difficult to assess. Um, there are probably some secondary effects on feeding and predator avoidance that occurred uh, that also have some uh, impacts. I believe that the most important effects that we're going to see as we're able to assess this uh, are secondary sublethal effects. Uh, there were a large number of survivors, and there are going to be impacts to those fishes. Um, we might expect increased cancer rates or reduced reproductive success. Uh, but the bottom line here with all of this is it's difficult to detect and establish cause and effect. Uh, but this is actually uh, a snapper. It was in an oil exposed area long ago before this deep water horizon event. This is a tumor. I don't know if it's cancerous or not. We never tested for that. We did test them for oil. Uh, these are some lesions on some uh, pelagic fish, a little tunny that were in the area. Again, no way to establish cause and effect, uh, but they're starting to see some of these types of things uh, in areas where fish were heavily exposed to oil uh, from this current event. So just to summarize the point I was trying to make, in natural systems, if you really want to collapse a system, uh, if you do something that affects primary production in a negative way, or secondary production in a negative way, or reproduction in a negative way, you can begin to collapse 
uh, the system in a way that will make it hard to recover from that. But in a highly productive system like what we've got here, uh, it can take a lot of insults and be resilient to that. So again, um, is this system likely to show resilience? I believe so, mostly based on its history. Uh, it's been very, very resilient. Uh, again, this event uh, was a, a proportion that I hope I never see in my lifetime. Uh, and when that first happened, I was scared, but I believe the system will do quite well. Thanks for listening.